anyway. I miss you a lot, old man. Summer broke on the backs of children, even though swings performed miracles and breezes sang psalms. For that summer, from the outskirts of some far-off, even whimsical place, came the low, resolute moo of a dragon. A child, of course, could not recognize that fabled moo, or the serpentine tail close to her feet, wound up among the thistle and milkweed like a hose. Nor, for that matter, could she recognize the starry white bone left upright in the sandbox, like some remarkable claw or shovel. Not when the sun was out and games continued, certainly not when there was summer love and root beer. But at dusk, when the fog crept in, thick and sweating, suggesting some kind of burning far off, down over there, where someone once saw two eyes pale as October moons blink. A child could know the meaning of fall. And that August, two weeks before school began, some children went down to that place, and they never came back. Dass die Angst als Grundbefindlichkeit in solcher Weise erschließt, dafür ist wieder die alltägliche Daseinsauslegung und Rede der unvereingenommenste Beleg. Befindlichkeit, so wurde früher gesagt, macht offenbar wie eine Mist. In der Angst ist einem unheimlich. Darin kommt zunächst die eigentümliche Unbestimmtheit dessen, wobei sich das Dasein in der Angst befindet zum Ausdruck. Das nicht so mehr ist. Unheimlichkeit meint aber dabei zugleich, dass nicht zu Hause sind. Das nicht zu Hause sein. When I copied down the German a week ago, I was fine. Then last night I found the translation, and this morning, when I went to work, I didn't feel at all myself. It's probably just a coincidence. I mean that there's some kind of connection between my state of mind and the Navidson record, or even a few arcane sentences on existence penned by a former Nazi tweaking on who knows what. More than likely, it's something entirely else, the real root lying in my already strange mood fluctuations. Though I guess those are pretty recent, too rocking back and forth between wishful thinking and some private agony until the bar breaks. I have no fucking clue. These days I'm an apprentice at a tattoo shop on Sunset. I answer phones, schedule consultations, and clean up. Any idiot could handle it. In fact, the job's reserved for idiots. This afternoon, though, how do I explain it? Something's really off. I'm off. I can't do a fucking thing. I just keep staring at all the ink we have, that wild variety of color, everything from root beer, midnight blue, and cochineal, to mauve, light doe, lilac, south sea green, maize, even pelican black, all lined up in these plastic caps like tiny transparent thimbles, and needles too, my eyes catching on all those carefully preserved points, and we have hundreds, mostly twelve sharps, many singles, though plenty in two, three, four, five, six, and seven needle groups, even a fourteen round shader depends on what you need. I don't know what I need, but for no apparent reason I'm going terribly south. Nothing has happened, absolutely nothing, but I'm still having problems breathing. The air in the shop is admittedly thick with a steady smell of sweat, isopropyl alcohol, benzol, all that solution for the ultrasonic cleaner, even solder and flux, but that's not it either. Of course no one notices. My boss, a retinue of his friends, some new inductee who just put down $150 for a rose, keep up the chatter. Pretty loud chatter, too, though never quite enough to drown out the most important sound of all, the single insistent buzz of an original J tattoo machine, logging yet another hundred stabs a minute in the dimple of some chunky ass. I get a glass of water. I walk out in the hallway. That's a mistake. I should have stayed near people, the comfort of company and all that. Instead, I'm alone running through a quick mental checklist. Food poisoning? Stomach's fine. Withdrawals? Haven't been on a GAC or ecstasy diet for several months, and while I didn't smoke any pot this morning. I, my usual ritual, I know THC doesn't create any lasting physical dependencies. And then out of the bee fucking blue, everything gets substantially darker. Not pitch black, mind you. Not even power failure black. More like a cloud passing over the sun. Make that a storm. Though there is no storm, no clouds. It's a bright day, and anyway, I'm inside. I wish that had been all. Just a slight decrease in illumination, a little breathing difficulty could still blame that on a blown fuse or some aberrant drug-related flashback. But then my nostrils flare with the scent of something bitter and foul, something inhuman, reeking with so much rotten years, telling me in the language of nausea that I'm not alone. Something's behind me. Of course I deny it. It's impossible to deny. I want to puke. 
To get a better idea, try this. Focus on these words, and whatever you do, don't let your eyes wander. Now imagine, just beyond your peripheral vision, maybe behind you, maybe to the side of you, maybe even in front of you, but right where you can't see it, something is quietly closing in on you. So quiet, in fact, that you can only hear it as silence. Find those pockets without sound. That's where it is, right at this moment. But don't look. Keep your eyes here. Now take a deep breath. Go ahead, take an even deeper one. Only this time, as you start to exhale, try to imagine how fast it will happen, how hard it's going to hit, how many times it will stab your jugular with its teeth, or are they nails? Don't worry, that particular detail doesn't matter. Because before you have time to even process that you should be moving, you should be running, you should at the very least be flinging up your arms, you sure as hell shouldn't be listening to me. You won't have time to even scream. Don't look. I didn't. Of course I looked. I looked so fucking fast I should have ended up wearing one of those neck braces for whiplash. My hands had gone all clammy, my face was burning up. Who knows how much adrenaline had just been dumped into my system. Before I turned, it felt exactly as if in fact I had turned, and at that instant caught sight of some tremendous beast crouched off in the shadows, muscles twitch from firing its great mass forward, ragged claws slowly extending, digging into the linoleum, even as its eyes are dilating beyond the point of reason, completely obliterating the iris, and by that widening fire the glowing furnace of witness, a camera lucida, with me in silhouette like some silly hand shadow twitching about upside down. Is that right, or am I getting confused? Either way, registering at last the sign it must have been waiting for. My own recognition of exactly what has been waiting for me all along. Except that when I finally do turn, jerking around like the scared shitless shit for brains I am, I discover only a deserted corridor. Or was it merely a recently deserted corridor? This thing, whatever it had been, obviously beyond the grasp of my imagination, or for that matter, my emotions, having departed into alcoves of darkness, seeping into corners and floors, cracks and outlets, gone even to the walls. Lights now normal. The smell history, though my fingers still tremble, and I've yet to stop choking on large, irregular gulps of air as I keep spinning around like a stupid top, spinning around on the top of nothing, looking everywhere, even though there's absolutely nothing, nothing anywhere. I actually thought I was going to fall, and then just as abruptly as I'd been possessed by this fear, it left me, and I fell back into control. The human ear cannot distinguish one sound wave from the same sound wave if it returns in less than 50 milliseconds. Therefore, for anyone to hear a reverberation requires a certain amount of space. At 68 degrees Fahrenheit, sound travels at approximately 1,130 feet per second. A reflective surface must stand at least 56 and one half foot away in order for a person to detect the doubling of her voice. In other words, to hear an echo, regardless of whether eyes are open or closed, is to have already seen a sizable space. We hold our dreams in lost dreams and tear our hearts out over chance. She carried the songs of centuries, and in her passing, my madness passed. C'était la saison de la guerre.
The alienation of Karen and Everton's children finally becomes apparent to both of them one evening in the middle of July. Karen is upstairs sitting on the bed playing with a deck of tarot cards. Neverton is downstairs in his study examining several slides returned from the lab. News of Oliver North's annulled conviction plays on the television. In the background we can hear Chad and Daisy squealing about something, their voices peeling through the house, the strained music of their play threatening at any instant to turn into a brawl. Okay. With superb cross-cutting, Navidson depicts how both he and Karen react to the next moment. Karen has drawn another card from the deck, but instead of adding it to the cross slowly forming before her cross legs, the occult image hangs unseen in the air, frozen between her two fingers, Karen's eyes already diverted, concentrating on a sound, a new sound, almost out of reach, but reaching her just the same. Navidson is much closer. His children's cries immediately tell him that they are way out of bounds. Karen has only just started to head downstairs, calling out for Chad and Daisy, her agitation and panic increasing with every step, when Navidson bolts out of the study and races for the living room. The terrifying implication of their children's shouts is now impossible to miss. No room in the house exceeds a length of 25 feet, let alone 50 feet, let alone 56 and a half feet, and yet Chad and Daisy's voices are echoing, each call responding with an entirely separate answer. In the living room, Navidson discovers the echoes emanating from a dark doorless hallway, which has appeared out of nowhere on the west wall. Without hesitating, Navidson plunges in after them. Unfortunately, the living room hiate cannot follow him, nor for that matter can Karen. She freezes on the threshold, unable to push herself into the darkness towards the faint flicker of light within. Fortunately, she does not have to wait too long. Davidson soon reappears with Chad and Daisy in each arm, both of them still clutching a homemade candle, their faces lit like sprites on a winter's eve. Yeah. Then one night, early in August, some friends drop in for dinner. As the evening progresses, one of them harps a little on Navidson's newfound domesticity. No more crazy Navy, eh? Are those days just gone for good? I remember when you'd party all night, shoot all morning, and spend the rest of the day developing your film. In a closet with just a buck and a bulb if you had to. I'm willing to bet you don't even have a dark room here. Which is a little too much for Navidson to bear. You want to see a dark room? I'll show you a dark room. Karen immediately cries no. Come on, there are friends. Navidson says, leading the two into the living room where he instructs them to look out the window so they can see for themselves his ordinary backyard. Satisfied that they understand nothing but trees and lawn could possibly lie on the other side of the wall, he retrieves the four colored keys hidden in the antique bassinet in the foyer. Everyone is pretty tipsy and the general mood is so friendly and easy it seems impossible to disturb. Which of course all changes when Davidson unlocks the door and reveals the whole Garen afterwards is so enraged by the whole incident, she makes Davidson sleep on the couch with his beloved hallway. No surprise, Davidson fails to fall asleep. He tosses around for an hour until he finally gets up and goes off in search of his camera. The title card reads Exploration A. The timestamp on Davidson's camcorder indicates that it is exactly 3.19 am. Call me impetuous or just curious. We hear him mutter as he shoves his sore feet into a pair of boots. But a little look around isn't gonna hurt. Without ceremony, he unlocks the door and slips across the threshold taking with him only a Hyatt, a Maglite, and his 35mm Nikon. The commentary he provides us with remains very spare. Cold. Wow, really cold. Walls are dark, similar to the closet space upstairs. Within a few seconds, he reaches the end. The hallway cannot be more than 70 feet long. That's it. Nothing else. No big deal. Over this, Karen and I have been fighting. Except as Navidson swings around, he suddenly discovers a new doorway to the right. It was not there before. What the... 
Leverton carefully nudges his flashlight into the new darkness and discovers an even longer corridor. This one's easily, I'd say, a hundred feet. A few seconds later, he comes across a still larger corridor, branching off to the left. It is at least 15 feet wide, with a ceiling well over 10 feet high. The length of this one, however, is impossible to estimate, as Navidson's flashlight proves useless against the darkness ahead, dying long before it can ever come close to determining an end. Navidson pushes ahead, moving deeper and deeper into the house, eventually passing a number of doorways leading off into alternate passageways or chambers. Here's a door, a lock, a room, not very big, empty, no windows, no switches, no outlets. Heading back to the corridor, leaving the room. It seems colder now, maybe I'm just getting colder. Here's another door, unlocked, another room, again no windows, <sighs> continuing on. Flashlight and camera skitter across the ceiling and floor in loose harmony, stabbing into small rooms, alcoves or spaces reminiscent of closets, though no shirts hang there. Still, no matter how far Navidson proceeds down this particular passageway, his light never comes close to touching the punctuation point promised by the converging perspective lines, sliding on and on and on, spawning one space after another, a constant stream of corners and walls, all of them unreadable and perfectly smooth. Finally, Navidson stops in front of an entrance much larger than the rest. It arcs high above his head and yawns into an undisturbed blackness. His flashlight finds the floor, but no walls, and for the first time, no ceiling. Only now do we begin to see how big Navidson's house really is. Carrie suggested we go for a drive in her new two-door BMW coupe. In the parking lot, we slipped into her bucket seats. Carrie took over from there. At nearly 90 miles per hour, she zipped us up to that windy edge known to some as Mulholland, a sinuous road running the ridge of the Santa Monica Mountains, where she then proceeded to pump her vehicle in and out of turns, sometimes dropping down to 50 miles per hour, only to immediately gun it back up to 90 again. Fast, slow, fast, fast, slow. Sometimes a wide turn, sometimes a quick one. She preferred the tighter ones, the sharp, controlled jerk swinging left to right before driving back to the right, only so she could do it all over again until after enough speed and enough wind and more distance than I'd be prepared to expect, taking me to parts of the city I rarely think of and never visit. Hey, pretty, don't you wanna take a ride with me through my world? Hey, pretty, don't you wanna kick and slide through my world? I can't remember the inane things I started babbling about then. I know it didn't really matter. She wasn't listening. She just yanked up on the emergency brake, dropped her seat back, and told me to lie on top of her. On top of those leather pants of hers. Extremely expensive leather pants, mind you. Her hands immediately guiding mine over those soft, slightly oily folds. Positioning my fingers on the shiny metal tab, small and round like a tear. Then murmuring a murmur so inaudible that even though I could feel her lips tremble against my ear, she seemed far, far away. Pinch it, she'd said, which I did, lightly until she also said pull it, which I also did, gently parting the teeth one at a time down under and beneath the longest unzipping of my life. We never even kissed or looked into each other's eyes. Our lips just trespassed on those inner labyrinths hidden deep within our ears, filled them with the private music of wicked words, hers in many languages, mine in the off color of my only tongue, until as our tones shifted and our consonants spun and squealed, rattled faster, hesitated, raced harder, syllables soon melting into groans or moans, finding purchase in new words or old words, 
or made up words until we gathered up our heat and refused to release it, enjoying too much the dark language we had suddenly stumbled upon, craved to, carved to, not a communication really, but a channeling of our rumored desires. Hers, for all I know, gone to black forests and wolves, mine banging back to the familiar form, that great revenant mystery I still could only hear the shape of, which in spite of our separate lusts and individual cries, still continued to drive us deeper into stranger tones, our mutual desire to keep gripping the burn, fueled by sound, her screeching mine. I didn't hear mine, only hers, probably counterpointing mine. A high-pitched cry, then a whisper dropping unexpectedly to practically a bark, a grunt, whatever. No sense anymore, and suddenly no more curves either, just the straightaway. Too bad dark languages rarely survive. Paces. Waiting reminds him that clarity is painful, but his pain is unreadable, obscure, chiaroscuro to their human senses. In time they will misread his gait, his moon-mad eyes, the almost gentle way his tail caresses the bars. In time they will mistake him for something else. Without history, without the shadow of being, a creature without the penance of living. They will read only his name. They will be unable to perceive what strangeness lies beneath his patience. Patience is the darkest side of power. He is dark. He is black. He is exquisitely powerful. He has made pain his lover and hidden her completely. Now he will never forget. She will give birth to memories they believe he has been broken of. He smells the new rain, tastes its change. His claw skates along the cold floor. Love curled up and died on such a floor. He blinks. Clarity improves. He hears other creatures scream and fade. But silence is his. He knows. In time the gates will open. In time his heart will open. Then the shadows will bleed. And the locks will break. On the sixth day, they still make an early start. The knowledge that they are heading back keeps Wax and Jed's spirit elevated. Holloway, however, remains uncharacteristically sallow, revealing what critic Melissa Dow Janis calls a sign of his deepening atrobilious obsession with the unpresent. Nevertheless, the climb still proceeds smoothly until Holloway discovers the remains of one of their footlong neon markers barely clinging to the wall. It has been badly mauled, half of the fabric torn away by some unimaginable claw. Even worse, their next cache has been gutted. Only traces of the plastic water jug remain, along with a few scattered pieces of power bars. Fuel for the campfire stove has completely disappeared. That's nice. Wax murmurs. Holy shit. Jed hisses. Emily O'Shaughnessy points out in the Chicago Entropy Journal the importance of this discovery. Here at last are the first signs, evidenced ironically enough by the expurgation of a neon sign and the team's provisions, of the house's powerful ability to exercise any and all things from its midst. Holloway Roberts 
is not nearly as analytical. He responds as a hunter, and the image that fills the frame is a weapon. Kneeling beside his back, we watch as he pulls out his Weatherby 300 Magnum and carefully inspects both the bolt and the scope mounts before loading five 180 grain nozzler partition rounds in the magazine. The chamber the six round, a glimmer of joy flickers across Holloway's features, as if finally something about that place has begun to make sense. Fueled by the discovery, Holloway insists on exploring at least some of the immediate hallways branching off the staircase. Soon enough he is stalking doorways, leading the dancing moon of Jed's flashlight with the barrel of his rifle, and always listening. Corners, however, only reveal more corners, and Jed's light only targets ashen walls, though soon enough they all begin to detect that inimitable growl, like Gavin glaciers far off in the distance, which at least in the mind's eye inhabits a thin line where rooms and passageways must finally concede to become a horizon. The growl almost always comes like the rustle of a high mountain wind on the trees. Navidson explained later. You hear it first in the distance, a gentle rumble, slowly growing louder as it descends until finally it's all around you sweeping over you and then past you until it's gone a mile away, two miles away. Impossible to follow. Esther Newhost, in her essay Music as a Place in the Navidson Record, provides an interesting interpretation of the sound. Gert Arons remarked uh, in a letter to Johann Peter Ackermann, March 23rd, 1829, I call architecture frozen music. The unfreezing of form in the Navidson house releases that music. Unfortunately, since it contains all the harmonies of time and change, only the immortal may savor it. Mortals cannot help but fear those commemorating walls. After all, do they not still sing the song of our end? For Holloway, it is impossible to merely accept the growl as the quality of that place anymore. Upon seeing the turn marker and their lost water, he seems to transfigure the eerie sound into an utterance made by some definitive creature, thus providing him with something concrete to pursue. Holloway almost seems drunk as he rushes after the sound, failing to lay down any fishing line or hang neon markers, rarely even stopping to rest. Jed and Wax do not draw the same conclusion as Holloway. They realize quite accurately, too, that even though they are traveling farther and farther away from the staircase, they are not getting any closer to the source of the growl. They insist on turning around. Holloway refuses to follow them. For a while, he rants and raves, screaming profanities at a blue streak until finally and abruptly, he just storms off by himself, vanishing into the blackness. It is another peculiar event which is almost over before it starts. A sudden enfilade of fuck yous and shitheads followed by silence. Back on the staircase, Jed and Wax wait for Holloway to cool off and return. When several hours pass and there is still no sign of him, they make a brief foray into the area, calling out his name, doing everything in their power to locate him and bring him back. Not only do they not find him, they do not come across a single neon marker or even a shred of fishing line. Holloway has run off blind. What a terrible thought. But you are too young for trees to know anything of their lives. And they never oh, came back. I'm not. And they never came back. I'm sharing and this with you in my reflections. This is an open book. You're not old man. This is an open book. This is an open book. Yeah, it's all I still get nightmares. I still get nightmares. I still get nightmares. I still get nightmares. The last eight years. Be kind to my own life. This is an open book.
Consider Raphael Guitar Servagio's The Language of Torture. New York, St. Martin's Press, 1995, page 13, where he likens Chad's experience to those of Romans listening to Perilous's devilish chamber. This unusual work of art was a life-size replica of a bull, cast in solid brass, hollowed out with a trap door in the back through which victims were placed. A fire was then lit beneath the belly, slowly cooking anyone inside. A series of musical pipes in the bull's head translated the tortured screams into strange music. Supposedly, the tyrant Phalaris killed the inventor Perilous by placing him inside his own creation. thinking of old man Z here and those pipes in his head working over time, alchemist to his own secret anguish lost in an art of suffering, though what exactly was the fire that burned him? As I strain now to see past the Navidson record, beyond this strange filigree of imperfection, the murmur of Zampano's thoughts, endlessly searching, reaching, but never quite concluding, barely even pausing, a ruin of pieces, gestures, and quests, a compulsion brought on by... Well, that's precisely it. When I look past it all, I only get an inkling of what tormented him, though at least if the fire's invisible, the pain's not, mortal and guttural, torn out of him day and night, week after week, month after month, until his throat's stripped and he can barely speak and he rarely sleeps. He tries to escape his invention but never succeeds because, for whatever reason, he is compelled day and night, week after week, month after month, to continue building the very thing responsible for his incarceration. Though is that really right? I'm the one whose throat is stripped. I'm the one who hasn't spoken in days. And if I sleep, I don't know when anymore. A few hours drift by. I broke off to shuffle some feeling back into my knees and try to make sense of the image now stuck inside my head. It's been haunting me for a good hour now and I still don't know what to make of it. I don't even know where it came from. Zimpano is trapped, but where may surprise you? He's trapped inside me. And what's more, he's fading. I can hear him, just drifting off, consumed within. Digested, I suppose, dying perhaps, though in a different way. Which is to say, yes, thou sees me not, old man, but I know thee well. Though I don't know who just said that, all of which is unfinished business, a distant moon to sense, and not particularly important, especially since his voice has gotten even fainter, still echoing in the chambers of my heart, sounding those eternal tones of grief, though no longer playing the pipes in my head. I can see myself clearly. I am in a black room. My belly is brass and I am hollow. I am engulfed in flames and suddenly very afraid. How am I so transformed? Where, I wonder, is the Phalaris responsible for lighting this fire now sweeping over my sides and around my shoulders? And if Zampano's gone, and I suddenly know in my heart he's very, very gone, why does strange music continue to fill that black room? How is it possible the pipes in my head are still playing? And who do they play for? 